the real estate crash has started. Even the New York Times is coming out and saying the housing market is worse than you think. So how low will prices go and why might this crash look a lot different than the one we saw in 2009? I'm going to explain this to you in one simple, fast step. Step number one, let's get right into this Case-Shiller chart of U.S. home prices. And we can see that prices are already falling. This chart goes all the way back to 1988 to roughly today's date. And on the left, it's an index. We go from 50 up to 120. In 1986 or so, call it, we were right at 60. And it goes down to pretty much its historic trend line. If we had a chart, and we'll throw one up going all the way back to 1900, you would see that prices really didn't go up from 1900 all the way to 1998 when you adjust for inflation. Then we go into the housing boom of the early 2000s. You guys most likely remember that. And prices go parabolic. They go all the way up to, let's call it 100 on this index, but then they come crashing all the way down. Where? To their historic trend line or very near their historic trend line going all the way back to 1900. And then the Fed comes in with quantitative easing, dropping interest rates and trying to prop up the economy. And the housing market bottoms out in 2012 and then goes right back up to where it was. But then recently, since the Cerveza sickness, in 2020 and 2021, prices have gone even higher. In fact, much, much higher than they were at the peak of the last bubble in 2006. Now let's go over some of the reasons you're not hearing in the mainstream media as to why prices could come down even further. First and foremost, we've got what I call forced supply. I'm sure when you listen to the news or you listen to CNBC, you always hear that the supply in the housing market is very, very low. There aren't that many people who are selling their house. And since prices are set at the margin, if there's very few homes for sale and you still have significant demand, that's going to increase the prices of all the other homes across the United States that aren't currently on the market. And although it is very true, builders have not built those starter homes because they're simply unprofitable. And when I mean starter home, I'm talking about the typical three bedroom, two bath, 1,500 square feet that were built in the 1960s, 1970s, 1980s. We're just not building any more of those because they're not economically feasible. But this doesn't mean that we can't have more supply of those homes or all homes in general coming back onto the market. Let's think about this. If we go into a recession, and this is key, you guys watch my videos, you know we've been talking about the bond market and the inversions and the yield curve a lot. This inversion of the yield curve is a very powerful predictor of recession. So let's just assume we go into a recession in 2023. The unemployment rate most likely goes up. And if we have a hard landing, it could go up significantly. Also, we would see asset prices like the stock market go down. We've already seen the bond market get absolutely crushed when interest rates, like on the 10-year, have gone from 50 basis points all the way up to now at, let's say, 350 basis points, a massive increase in percentage terms. So what that means is all of the retirees and all of the average Joe and Janes that had these bonds in their portfolio have taken a huge haircut. So if you combine that with the S&P 500 going down by, let's say, 30 or 40 percent, this is going to have a massive impact on a lot of homeowners throughout the United States. And going back to the unemployment rate, I'd also point out Michael Burry's bullwhip effect. Another thing we've talked about on this channel extensively. So you've got companies like Amazon that had 800,000 employees in 2019, 
And now they have over 1.6 million. They hired all these additional people because of the sugar rush, the economic sugar rush from all the stimulus checks. Well, those have now come to an end. So we could see Amazon maybe not go back to 800,000 employees, but even if they went back to a million employees, they're still having to lay off or fire 600,000 people. And think about if that phenomenon happens throughout all the businesses in the United States. So we could see this dynamic where people might not want to sell their house, but they have to sell their house. They don't have a choice. Let me give you an example. Right down here, we've got not the average Joe, but the average Joe's grandfather. <laughs> That's right. We've got G Pa Joe, we'll call him. He's there with his cane. He's 75 years old. He retired. But the good news is G Pa Joe has a house and he has a significant amount of equity. But he sees all around him. He's checking Zillow every single day. And he sees the prices going down, and this is stressing him out. He's losing a lot of sleep over this. Let's say his portfolio right now includes $500,000 of equity in this house, maybe $50,000 portfolio, which has been taking a huge haircut because of the bonds in the portfolio have gone down significantly in price, like we said earlier. And then maybe he's getting $1,500 a month in Social Security. Let's say right now he's got a 3% fixed rate mortgage. So he doesn't want to give that up if he sells the home and buys another one. Then his mortgage rate could go up to, let's say, 7%. So he's motivated to keep his house. But on the other side of the coin, he's looking around him, seeing prices coming down, and he's reading the news about the recession. Maybe he's looking at the yield curve, and he says, wait a minute here. The majority of my net worth, the amount of purchasing power that I need to get me to the end, meaning the end of my life, quite literally, is pretty much in this house. So I could sit back and hold the house and just roll the dice that prices don't go down, or I could sell right now, extract that equity, and I might have to live in a much smaller place and rent it out, but at least I've got my purchasing power to last me into my 80s, 90s, and maybe hopefully even further to make sure that I don't have to work at Walmart or McDonald's to make ends meet. So this is just another example of forced supply coming onto the market because of a recession that could put downward pressure even on nominal prices. But another thing you won't hear in the mainstream media is alternatives. So from 2012 to pretty much today's date, all of these huge funds like Blackstone have been buying up properties all around the United States. Why? Because it was their best risk reward. But now we've got T-bills that are yielding, let's say 4.5, 4.6%. And let's say that you could get this on a six-month treasury. So now you have these groups like Blackstone saying, well, wait a minute here. We're getting 5% on our rental properties, and we've got to deal with tenants and toilets. Why on earth would we do that when we could just get 4.5% on a six-month T-bill, roll it over, and have ultimate liquidity? And I'm not the only one that's pointing this out. Editor, let's cut right to a clip from my good buddy Adam Taggart where he interviews housing expert Nick Jurley on his show called Wealthium. There's anywhere from 20 to 30 million single family homes in America that are investor owned homes and second owned homes where the owner does not live there, right? So think about that. That's a quarter of all single family homes in America. So think about that in terms of this logic and this thinking about what's going on in the recession. And, you know, these people can easily sell. They don't live there. Right. And that's something we actually did not see in, as, as much in 06. Believe it or not, in 06, we had a higher share of people actually living as a primary occupant in the home than we do now. And so that's something, especially in investor driven housing markets, that I think could lead to a subprime 2.0.
type of situation where the investors all of a sudden start selling. Like we know already, they've stopped buying uh, in a lot of markets. But once they start selling, that has the potential to just flood the market with inventory in a way that's very difficult for people to conceive of right now. So we've gone from an environment of Tina, there is no alternative, to an environment where we've got plenty of alternatives, maybe alternatives that are a lot better than dealing with those rental properties. So what do they do? They sell them onto the market so they can take that cash and buy, let's say, treasuries. So that increases the supply, which again, puts further downward pressure on prices. So then the question becomes, okay, George, I get what you're saying here with the charts and the forced supply, the alternatives. This makes a lot of sense. But the main question that I want to know is how low will prices go? Will we see them go all the way back to 2012? And my answer is yes. There are no certainties, only probabilities. But this is my base case. But here's the catch. They might not go down that far in nominal terms, only when you adjust for inflation. Editor, go ahead and throw up a chart of the housing market in the 1970s. We can see that housing prices throughout the 1970s went up, although there were a couple periods where they plateaued. So compare that to a chart of prices adjusted for inflation. You get a much different picture. You see that there were a couple peaks, but prices at certain times actually came right back down. And this is what I think you'll most likely see throughout the 2020s. Right now, we've seen nominal prices going down. And if we look at many articles out there, like this New York Times article, a lot of experts are predicting that prices could go down in nominal terms, while well, let's say 20% just in 2023. But then even if prices go back down slightly or plateau like they did in the 1970s, if we continue with high rates of inflation at 10%, maybe 7%, or even 5% compounded year after year, it doesn't take you long, maybe three or four years, before prices adjusted for inflation go right back to where they were in 2012. And that's why I said at the beginning of this video that the next real estate crash that we could be going into right now may look a lot different than what we saw in 2009 when nominal prices just came crashing straight down. This time, they might come down slightly, they might even plateau, but when you combine that with the rate of inflation being relatively high, you would see the exact same chart in real terms, but in nominal terms, the chart would look a lot more like it did in the 1970s. For more content that'll help you build wealth and thrive in a world of out of control central banks and big governments, check out this playlist right here. I will see you on the next video.